Kai, welcome to the latest Garland Ring Around. And it's uh, my great pleasure to introduce uh, this evening you to Ishan Kosler, who's a graphic designer based at the moment in Delhi, uh, who studied abroad in the US and came back to India, seeing the great challenges that were there in terms of graphic design and uh, has developed what is a very interesting model for working with crafts. We don't normally think of crafts as having a direct relationship to graphic design. And uh, in this case, uh, Ishan Kosler has found a modus vivendi for connecting the material knowledge of crafts to the kinds of patterns that we see on the screen right now. It's been my great pleasure to work with Ishan over the years. Uh, he was a designer in a project uh, called Sangam Project, which used graphic design quite, in, quite integrally into the, the logic of that particular project, particularly working with embroiderers in Kutch. And uh, he's going to explain this a bit further uh, now with the, uh, the use, recent uses of type in uh, development from crafts. And uh, I should also say that uh, Ishan, of course, is the representative on the uh, editorial board of uh, For India on For Garland. So it's a great pleasure to welcome you, Ishan. Thank you, Kevin. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in today. Uh, yes, uh, uh, you know, I've known Kevin for about a decade, and I think our experiences together have actually shaped a lot of uh, what's happening with Typecraft. Uh, with the Sangam project being one of the first projects where I got to work on a, you know, a typographic rendition, a logo from a craft. And I think that eventually uh, evolved into something like this. Um, and what you see here is uh, rights to writing is actually written in the Godna tattoo typeface. Um, and it's also addressing a very key aspect of language itself where which talks about basically how uh you know well one is the, the idea of rites of passage or images or symbols like the tattoos have been converted into uh, another writing system um, um you know so, so it's gone from pictograms to graphemes um and so that so there's a different symbology and language of the tattoos itself and that has got translated in this whole process uh, through graphic design and uh, you know working with artisans uh, into uh, into a writing system, so I'll just briefly talk about um, the Typecraft Initiative, um, which actually was started about eight years ago now in 2012, um, and really it is about uh, you know it was started with the aim to create a series of digital typefaces uh, in both Latin and Indic scripts. Um, from vernacular crafts and tribal arts uh, of India, but it could also be, of course, from other countries. The idea was really initially to create, uh, you know, livelihood through the commission and the sale of the fonts. Um, and, you know, simply put, type craft really is about making type from crafts. That's what really it, it boils down to. Um, I think one of the important goals of Typecraft is to promote and uh, archive as well as innovate the intangible heritage, uh, the cultural heritage of India um, to audiences not only within India but all over the world. So we, this is example. Uh, these are some images of an exhibition we had recently conducted at uh, Atelier Muji in Tokyo, um, and it was a basically a kind of re like a retrospective of all the work we've been doing related to typecraft, including Sangam, which is not a font, but it's a logo. And here you see Kutch, another identity logo project we worked on with crafts. Um, so it's traveled to various places. This was at the London Design Festival a few years back. Um, and I think why people are interested in, in this uh, initiative and in this project is because this transformation of a craft to a completely different medium, such as digital, is something very new. Um, and, you know, Typecraft allows for crafts to be used on a range of applications for the first time. For instance, the creation of signage or websites, book covers, even artworks uh, can be done in this medium. 
So let's go back a little bit. Um, just skip to slide here. So um, to talk about decline. Unfortunately, a lot of crafts in India um, and tribal arts art forms are on the decline for various reasons. Um, you know, for instance, in the case of the tattoo, uh, you know, traditionally they were a form of livelihood uh, for the Godaharins, the women who apply the tattoo, um, and uh, on different tribal communities. But what is happening is that over time, um, you, you see this was, these are like pictures just taken a couple of years ago. You only see older women um, in these villages with the tattoos. And the reason for this is that one is there's a lack of interest and uh, I think social change overall. Um, the other is that tribals are migrating to cities in search of jobs. And uh, because they're, you know, they're in, in, an, in an urban environment, they don't feel comfortable uh, covering the entire body uh, in a work situation. Uh, perhaps because it's frowned upon or people don't understand the meanings. So for various reasons, um, there's a decline happening. And really briefly, um, I'll touch upon a few points such as, um, you know, what are they doing? What are the, so the community of tribal artists, as I said, Godarins, in response to the declining uh, use of tattoos or tattooing, they're actually making products, right? So for instance, they're making saris or garments or they're again trying to get commissions to do uh, wall uh, murals, etc. So that's how they're trying to eke out a living. Um, but what we tried to do with Typecraft was we we said, okay, why don't you come and you know we do a workshop, um, you know, and then they got uh, paid for that workshop. They were very happy with the pay. We usually, how payment works is again case to case basis. But uh, in this case, we had a direct contact with the uh, craftspeople. So uh, it was different while working with an NGO. When you work through an NGO, usually the NGO tells you what are the you know fees, etc. Here we felt that you know they're coming from a very remote village, and uh, so we paid them more than what they wanted actually to be paid. And I guess they were very happy because the funds that they got, they said would last them four months, four to five months in the village, uh, which is which is nice to know that something could be done. But the other aspect is that it's also about giving back again. It, that's the idea of type, type craft. It's not just a one time. So each time you buy a font, a royalty goes back to that community. So we, what we do is we collect, um, you know, over a course of a year. And at the end of the year, we pay a certain token amount based on what has been collected from the, from the royalties. Um, I'm just going to briefly talk about a few of the typefaces uh, that we worked on. Um, there are quite a few, so I won't delve deeply into all of them, but uh, obviously the tattoo Godna is one of the ones I'm going to talk about more. Um, you know, each typeface is made from a craft or a tribal art which belongs to a certain uh, region, geographical region, material, process, and context. Um, so far, Typecraft has worked with, um, you know, Chitara, floor and wall art from Karnataka, um, that's down here. And then with Mithila art uh, up here in Bihar, but that's not a, not a font, but that was an artwork, uh, also done for the Sangam project. Um, as well as we worked in uh, Nagaland, uh, also for the Sangam project with uh, uh, Manipur Black Pottery. And uh, so the, why it's in Nagaland is because the potters actually live there, just so you guys know. Um, and then also we worked in Orissa, Tamil Nadu. So these are all projects where we worked on lettering. But in terms of the font itself, we worked in, as I said, Karnataka. Then we worked in Chhattisgarh with Godna Tattoo. In Rajasthan with Barmer Applique. And in Gujarat, we worked with several typefaces like uh, Rabadi, Souf, and Pako embroidery, as well as the Sangam logo itself was designed there. And uh, so was the Kutch identity. Um, I'm just going to briefly talk about our first font, which was the Chitara floor decoration uh, from Karnataka. It's made by the Diwaru community, and uh, traditionally they were. It's uh, done as a ritual basis, a uh, ritualistic basis. Um, this is actually Lord Shiva on top of a rat, but as you can see, it also you know evokes certain letters in the Latin script when you look at it from an outside perspective, outsider perspective. Um, so we worked with Radha Sulur for this first project. 
uh, who's from that area uh, in Joke Falls. And uh, traditionally, she would make these on the floor and wall as decoration. Uh, moving to the city of Bangalore, she needed to eke out you know, a living, make some uh, income from what she knew. And that's what's happening with a lot of Indian crafts is that they're becoming, uh, they're going from something that was ritualistic into commercial, into a commercial artistic domain. Um, so actually a lot of the times the craftspersons themselves are transforming their own craft. And then of course, we as designers come, uh, come from outside and make these you know, interjections and, uh, and interactions and, and actually create another type of transition. Um, so there was a, a lot of exchange with, uh, with Radha and actually how we work with crafts people is in a very collaborative manner. Uh, we give them a lot of freedom and there's a lot of dialogue and exchange that happens. Each project is different. There are different constraints and challenges, which I will get, which I will talk about as we go forward. I'm not going to get into the process of Chitara, but this is just to show you what the outcome was. I mean, there was this kind of exchange, and then in the end, we came up uh, with this display typeface with the help of Radha. Um, and then going back to Godna, uh, which we started with, the tattoo typeface from Chhattisgarh. Um, just talk about that. So traditionally, you know, um, so how we start a project is actually always understanding the context. Uh, we don't jump into making letters right away. And that's an important aspect of what we do. It's not just about making letters, but it's also about understanding the context, recording that context, and then of course, disseminating that as we are doing in this presentation or in exhibitions, et cetera, so that more people understand about these communities and the people we work with. So um, rites of passage actually refers to um, how different tattoo motifs were applied on various parts of the body to mark different you know, rites of passage of a woman from puberty to uh, marriage to childbirth, et cetera. Uh, some tattoos were also just done for decorative purposes and others are, were done for healing or curative purposes. Um, there's a whole litany of, you know, or a lexicon of these tattoos that we've kind of documented. Again, I won't get into the details of each of them, but they are there on our website and other resources. Uh, that talk about what are the meanings and the placements of, of each of the tattoos. Um, then we also, of course, documented the various, uh, you know, I would say the steps involved in making a tattoo, what are the materials used, uh, you know, in terms of the thorns or the, the, uh, the needles, as well as the ink, where do they get the ink from. Uh, we visited Chhattisgarh a couple of years ago and did a documentation of the process so there's actually soot that's con collected from, uh, you know, kerosene flame that you see in number one here. And then that soot is mixed with uh, some water and made into a paste. And that actually forms the base of the, of, the, of the black ink, which actually becomes permanently embedded in the skin. And here you see is a cluster of needles. Um, so actually earlier, as you could see, uh, you know, uh, thorns were used from different plants, but nowadays, um, the tattooers nowadays, meaning for the, quite a few centuries, they've been in touch with uh, metal smiths, the lohars, um, who actually provide them these needles. And uh, this is a cluster of needles that is then continuously pressed into the skin. So it's a continuous uh, dabbing into the skin uh, to create the design. Um, it's fairly painful, as one can imagine. I've not got it done, so I don't know, but I, I've been told it's fairly painful. Um, and then, you know, once the ink is, once the needle is applied several times with the ink, um, it's basically allowed to dry and uh, then the area is washed with cow dung and uh, which is supposed to have antiseptic properties. And then as you can see here, haldi or turmeric paste has been applied over the tattooed uh, skin for healing. So it's, it's supposed to be a healing, it has, it's supposed to have a healing property. Um, and then after this whole process, a puja or a prayer is done uh, to ward off evil spirits using various, you know, in India, chilies are used a lot. So again, chilies, rice, salt, and other materials are used uh, to create this puja. So this is just part of the whole process. Um, and then, of course, we invited three uh, Godharan, the tattoo artists, Sunita, Sumitra, and Ram Keli to our studio in Delhi to work with us. Um, and initially we created this kind of a 
you know, with their help, uh, like a chart in a way of all the tattoos, all the various symbols um, that they they know that they use, uh, you know, on on the body, and as well as what you saw earlier, where is it applied and where on the body it's applied, and what is the significance of that application? Whether is it decorative? Is it healing? Is it for healing purposes, or is it uh, something to do with rites of passage? So we we never we always try to when we start our uh, engagement with uh, craftspeople or tribal artists, we always start by easing them in to the process. We don't jump at creating letters from day one because it is quite um, intimidating for someone who's never worked with whether it's the Latin script or Indic scripts. Um, they don't they're not used to working with letters. It's it is fairly intimidating to just start jumping into that. So we start like this and then we say, okay, now can you please use these designs that you've shown us, the tattoo designs, and make letter forms from them. Um, again, when we do this transition, we don't give them any constraints. We say, can you just do it on your own? We, we obviously have to draw, like you can see here, we have drawn some of the letters for them and the pencil just to show what a G looks like or an A looks like in case. Some of them are illiterate in the in the Latin script, just as we are illiterate in their uh, tattoo language. Um, so they are they are also not literate in our uh, lexicon, I would say. But uh, what was interesting is that they created something fabulous. You know, as you can see, I mean, there, I think there's a lot of raw beauty in these letter forms. Um, however. Uh, they can't be used as a typeface because in a typeface you need consistency, you need something known as a cap height and an X height. And in this case, they're capital letters, so you need a certain height that needs to be fairly consistent across all letters. Otherwise, if certain letters are taller, you will have different letters inter intersecting when you have another sentence below it. Um, so you can see the R is much taller than the G, any of the Gs. Um, so while we really appreciated the beauty of these letters, we couldn't actually use them as is. However, what we told um, them is that why don't you take these elements further and we introduced them to certain constraints. So we said, okay, you have to have a certain letter height. Um, you have to have uh, certain thicknesses of the uh, letters to be maintained. As you can see here, there's a certain thickness maintained and a certain height. Uh, we asked them that maybe they could start with pencil uh, drawing with pencil first, and then they could start, uh, you know, painting over on top of that. Um, you know, some of the women found it much easier than others. I think the older women who are more used to doing tattoo found this a very challenging stage in which to work with. But um, in the end, I think they all really enjoyed um, this transition and this working with, in letters. See, the other thing of introducing letters is it's not just for the end product as a typeface. Um, what we're trying to do here is really inspire crafts people um, to think of their own craft in another avatar, in another form, whether it is in a, you know, letter is a type of a motif. It has a different type of function, of course, communication. Um, but it's, it's basically giving them a, I guess, a platform to try out new things, you know, and hopefully they can go back and say, okay, now maybe I made a letter, maybe I can make something else with my own craft. So one is, of course, the end, but the other important aspect is, is the means and how we're trying to inspire craftspeople to do new things with their own crafts. I'm just skipping forward to show you, you know, so this is kind of like the outcome that came out of this process where they, since there were three women, we have three different styles of letter forms. And then this is the final typeface that came out of this. Um, this, of course, this process raises some questions um, as, as any process would, because um, this is something very unprecedented as stated in the beginning. So, you know, um, I would say like uh, one of the questions raised is, the Godna tattoo in its digital avatar as a typeface is devoid of the original ritualistic and symbolic meaning. And, and its function uh, is no longer about marking rites of passage. Its function is really as a communication device or as an artistic device. Um, so it's transformed into some sort of a neutral uh, you know, form of uh, 
glyphs uh, or symbols, right? Which, which are understandable on a more broader worldwide platform by anyone who understands um, the English language or the Latin script can use it. Um, and so what does that mean? You know, is this a good thing? Is this not a good thing? I mean, this is something that one should think about here in this image. I've actually kind of played with that idea because I've made kind of gibberish from, I've gone back from the Latin script from the English language and made symbols, right? Um, which may mean nothing uh, or they may mean something. So they're, they're, there's a, it's like a cipher, but I'm kind of, I'm kind of questioning what is the meaning of this transition of something that's ancient, uh, it has a meaning for a community to be transformed into a more global, mainstreamized language, script used in a language. Um, the other thing is that, you know, one of the more obvious advantages of this transformation is that we, we're helping create a tool, right? So a font is a tool, it's not, it's not an end product in that sense. Like you can use this font and you can create anything you want, a poster, a book cover, or anything, an artwork, that you'd like to make. So it's in a way, it's a starting point that can be used by anyone, anywhere in the world um, uh, to interact with, right? Um, so I think that was an important decision that we took when making a typeface rather than something else. And why I mentioned that is, you know, we basically don't want to create a cushion cover or a mug or decorative objects which have been made ad nauseum out of Indian crafts. I'm not trying to put down other people, but I'm just saying that what happens when this sort of thing happens, I feel it really demeans the value of the craft as something only decorative and not functional and not something that can be used um, as a living craft. In a way, I would say a type, typeface is a living object because as I said, you can transform it and use it. Um, so it has that value and I think that's an important takeaway uh, from this presentation. Um, I'm gonna speed up here because we have just about 10, 15 minutes. So one of the things I wanted to um, talk about was, you know, how in most societies, um, and especially in India, you know, there's a divide between the mind, technology, uh, design, and, you know, craft, which is viewed uh, as something done by the hand, something done in a rural area. So there is this divide. And I think one of the ideas of Typecraft was really to break down these divides. Um, and barriers and basically inspire craftspeople to think like designers and at the same time get designers to be more hands-on. Um, so last couple of years, I would say something interesting started to happen. Uh, I was invited to various colleges such as the University of Edinburgh in Scotland, um, as well as in Indian, you know, various Indian colleges like NIFT um, and IICD in Jaipur, where they asked me that, hey, we really find your Typecraft project initi initiative very interesting. Can you engage students with this, right? So I thought that was an interesting twist to actually go backwards and uh, you know, get students to now think about crafts. So what we started doing was we, we, de we decided that students would not work on the computer, they work hands-on. And they were the first step would be to decipher the craft or really understand the lexicon or the language of the craft. Right? What are the motives? What are the forms it takes? Um, and then use that knowledge or that insight to make the letters. Um, and so that, that was, I think, an important um, step in, in where we are going forward. And then when we did the reverse. We went to, um, you know, in India, we went to Barmer. So this is Barmer applique, what you're seeing here, done by students at NIFT Gandhi Nagar. This is the same in, done in Edinburgh. Uh, and then we went, ended up in Barmer, Rajasthan earlier this year. And then we asked uh, the craftswomen to make letters, right? So straight away from paper, uh, using their know-how and knowledge of their own craft. Um, and actually what was, what was interesting about this whole process was that we discovered that a lot of these women were only in, involved in the implementation stage where they were asked to just stitch uh, the cloth right at the end of the, of the stage of design. They were never involved in the actual stages of design and creating forms. So this is something totally new that they've, they've never done this before. And uh, you know, we worked with about 15 to 20 craftswomen in this uh, workshop. So it was the largest workshop till date that we worked with. And of course, every person had a different skill set and a different ability and some learned faster, 
and others didn't. But what was very heartening to learn, uh, to see was how quickly they picked up letters. So all of these women were illiterate and they had never worked with letters before. They have never designed before. As I said, they were involved in the last stage of applique, which is the stitching of the, the cushion or the cloth, right? There's a, usually a back cloth and a front cloth. Um, and here they were asked to make something. And of course, this has taken a few days. I'm showing you the results after one or two days of working together where initially they couldn't make letters. They could just make simple shapes and forms. Um, and then we kind of, through encouragement, got them to get these, some of these letters, uh, you know, got them to make some letters. And what was even more encouraging was to see people like Bhami uh, Devi on the left and Nirmala on the right, who were actually getting even further ahead and starting to design the letters. They got so interested in this project that they started actually becoming designers, which was fantastic to see. And, um, you know, some of them even asked me that, oh, they want to learn, they want to become literate in English. How do they become that? They want to learn the language. Um, one of the women started sending her daughter back to school because her daughter was, she, she was literate and she could actually pick up the letters and she would keep calling out what are the different letters. And then she realized that, you know, she, I guess she must have realized the importance of language and literacy. And so this kind of uh, was a really revelatory uh, process for us and uh, we've taken this further even in Sufi embroidery where we actually had um, students first examine um, the motifs of Suf and really deconstruct them into building blocks you know basic building blocks like you've seen here and uh, this is a nift uh, in Gandhinagar and we asked them then okay can you use these building blocks to create simple shapes and then letters and what do those letters look like right so it, it, it's it's kind of like um, an interesting design uh, uh, thinking process and a design methodology process. And then we did this, and we, we did the flip when we went uh, to Kutch and worked with uh, the Suf uh, craftswomen. And I think this was again, uh, you know, it was really heartening to see how into this they were. And they said that no one has ever involved them in something like this. Usually what happens in these workshops is they're given cloth and they're, they're given a design and they're saying, okay, now I embroider this design onto this cloth um, or choose your own color. But, you know, a lot of limitations were given to them. Here they had an, you know, an option to make whatever they wanted to make using just paper um, and, but, but sticking to their motives. I'm actually moving forward because of lack of time. Um, but basically, this is, this is what the Suf embroidery eventually looked like after that workshop. It gave us a lot of insights into what various forms could look like. And of course, we also ended up drawing, doing some drawings based on uh, some of the forms that they had, the artisans had uh, come up with. Um, I'm just gonna move on to the challenges. So, you know, working on a typeface uh, from a craft is fairly challenging as you can imagine. Um, and, you know, uh, with each craft, there are different unexpected and unplanned challenges. Um, you know, sometimes um, we are in the field and uh, we have limited resources and time. And so we have to act very quickly and spontaneously to those challenges. And the thing is, there's no rule book to creating type craft, uh, typefaces based on crafts. This is fairly unprecedented and each craft has a different uh, tool. So, you know, usually font design is based on, uh, you know, the reed pen or a chisel or a certain tool. But here we're working with needles or uh, well, whether it's a tattoo needle or an embroidery needle or a scissor for applique, the tools change every time. And how do you define what the letter forms look like? So um, I'm just gonna delve into a couple of uh, uh, challenges. For instance, with Suf embroidery, one of the biggest challenges is that it is based on a count-based cloth. That means the warp and the weft have to be the same count. But if the warp and weft are not the same count, then it goes a little off. And here's where we got a lot of challenges in getting letter forms working in a certain way that we wanted them to work. Um, and, and again, because of time, I'm just gonna move forward. Sometimes the challenges are related to social norms. So here we're working with the, uh, the Rajput, the Jadeja, uh, on uh, Paco embroidery. And here what, what happened was, while the workshop happened, 
Um, I was told that I'm not allowed to be uh, near, near the women for too long because their men are not very comfortable with this. But this meant that I had to be uh, basically segregated and be in a different location and only be in contact once a day, if at all. That made it very challenging to be in a workshop where it's collaborative and there's a lot of back and forth and feedback to be given. Um, but this is something, again, I had to think on the fly. Um, and uh, the other one I wanted to talk about was, which is one of the biggest, I would say, contradictions of Typecraft, is whether to ornament or not. Um, and I'll explain that in a second. Basically, you know, uh, there's the challenge of reconciling the intricate nature of craft. Um, because, you know, type, type in general, letter forms in general are very minimal in nature. Whereas, um, you know, Indian crafts tend to be very ornamental. So how do you kind of reconcile these two opposites? And, uh, you know, going back to type, um, actually type comes from, I mean, it's a Western construct in terms of how type design has happened. And it's related to um, this whole history of modernism and how modernist, modernism was anti-ornament, right? So for instance, like this whole movement of modernism was a reaction to the 19th century various revolutions that happened against the bourgeoisie, against the, you know, the royalty that were uh, assumed to be super rich and uh, you know, had ornate objects and uh, the divide between the classes, et cetera, uh, led to something which was more minimal and more modern and viewed as more democratic um, and you know, anti-ornament. Um, so that's how type design came about. And it's really rooted in functionality uh, and minimalism, as we know. Uh, whereas, if you look at India, it is, you know, it's not a less is more country. <laughs> if you just walk anywhere, it, you know, you, you'll, be, you'll be hit by the surfeit of information coming at you, right? So it's basically a country that celebrates the ornament. And, and India doesn't have that history and baggage that the West has with aristocracy and, you know, the kind of ornateness that it connotes. Um, here, ornamentation is, uh, I would say, tantamount to beauty, uh, intricacy, and workmanship, right? So it's about pride as well. It's about culture. It's about identity. And so these are very important aspects to imbibe in, in, uh, in crafts. Um, so coming back to letters, you know, if you look at a typical Latin script A, um, the, the red dots you see here, I'm sorry, the blue dots you see here denote the nodes. So you can see like a typical A has between 10 to 30 nodes, maybe 10 to 20 nodes uh, in, a, in a Latin script A. Whereas if you look at a Godna A, we have over 5,000 nodes because of the complexity and the detail, the ornament, you know, the intricacy, I would say, of the letter form um, means that it has all of these nodes. Um, and that's, that's, that's the whole type craft uh, clash that I'm talking about. And I think, you know, what is interesting is that, um, or what is not interesting, but what is challenging is that um, because each character has such a large number of nodes, the file becomes very heavy and unwieldy to work in. You know, there's certain limitations that are arranged. And initially we had a lot of problems with the uh, Godna uh, making it work as a functional typeface. So we had done all the work of making it in, you know, on the computer, but actually to be able to type it, we had to work through a software called Glyphs. And my partner, Andrew Berlius from uh, Spain was instrumental in making this happen. And, um, you know, there were a lot of things that we had to decide because the program was not able to accept this sort of intricate typeface. So do we reduce the number of character sets of the font, which means like you, don't, you only have A to Z, you drop the numbers, for instance. Or do we reduce the number of nodes? But if you reduce the number of nodes, you actually lose the original, uh, I would say beauty of the craft, and what the, what the craftsperson, the artist had made would be lost. Um, the other option is to use components. This is a more technical term. Components just means basically uh, similar forms. So like a B, the top, this curve of the B could be used in a P or an R. Um, whereas when the artisans had done it, it's different because it's handmade. So the B, the P and the R are not exactly the same. But if you did a component, then we could actually copy these forms and re replicate them in other letters as well. But that would, again, take away something uh, from those letter forms. 
but ultimately, Andrew and uh, you know the people at Glyphs, the software that we we made this on, uh, sorted this out. Uh, they disabled something called subroutines in the Glyphs app, and disabling subroutines allowed not only to generate the font, but we could also generate uh, two more character sets. As I mentioned earlier, there were three women that we worked with. Each of them had created their own style of font, and so um, we managed to create. Eventually, um, as you can see here, there's a default style and then there's an alternate one, an alternate two, as well as what's known as dingbats, which are basically the different tattoos um, of the craft. Um, Kevin, do I have more, a few more minutes or do I, should I end here? Uh, just a couple more minutes, Ishan. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, another challenge, uh, I'll just quickly then talk about one challenge really quickly, is that when we work with the Rabadi women, for instance, um, they couldn't, they don't know how to draw, right? And we didn't, for, we didn't know this until we got there uh, because we, we tried to find out before, but we couldn't find out. And so then how do you work with someone who can't draw? And um, so one of the challenges was that, okay, we have to now look at their motives and try to figure out how to make letter forms from them. And uh, we were lucky that there was a lot of rich, uh, you know, in the village that we worked in, in Sum Rashi Sheikh, with Kala Raksha, there were a lot of um, motifs and archives available. Um, this is a, one of the walls. Uh, this is known as mud work or Lipai Kakam, uh, which is done, you know, very similarly. It looks very similar to, I would say, embroidery. And uh, so this is how we developed some of the letter forms, like the W. So we had to basically study their own forms, decipher them in a way, decode them, and then use that to create the different letters. Um, I'm just gonna end quickly by touching, up, touching, up, uh, touching uh, upon uh, future applications of Typecraft. <clears throat> so I think what, what is important is that Typecraft started out as a livelihood project. Um, and also, you know, about, it was about design thinking, making, you know, inspiring crafts people to think in different ways about their own crafts. But what happened over time was that uh, we realized that literacy was an important aspect because we noticed that women and the children that we work with are illiterate, but they definitely responded to making letters, as in the case of Bahar Aplik. <clears throat> so we said, okay, what, can we combine, can we use Typecraft as a literacy tool? Um, you know, and languages, as we know, began as, uh, as um, images. Right. I won't get into the whole detail, but just to give you an overview, um, you know, pictograms is where it all started. We still use pictograms today, but it started from the cave period, like 20,000 years ago. This is Bimbeka cave on the top, which Godna is related to in a way. There's hieroglyphics, the Indic script, the Indus Valley script rather, and then you have uh, the emojis. Um, so then it makes sense to teach uh, a language through images, right? And so we decided, or we, we've been thinking about how to use uh, ed tech, right? Uh, basically education technology to bring Typecraft to schools. Um, and uh, I mean, because of time, I'm just gonna quickly show you this animation. So here's a letter ko in Hindi, uh, where you could actually, a child could actually tap on the letter and come up with you know, learn about different, um, I would say, concepts or words or images that relate to that letter, right? So you have, you have the Kutub Minar, you have the Kamal Kapool, which is the lotus, and then you have uh, Kabutar Baz, or Kabutar, which is a bird, uh, all starting from the letter K, but it could also lead to all sorts of storytelling um, and uh, local contexts because each craft comes from a certain geographical location and each geographical location in India has a language and a script. And so how do we connect all of this together? Um, so that's where I'll leave it at. I'm happy to take any questions and thank you very much for your time. Indeed, Shukriya uh, Ishan for that uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, it reminded me of the discussion that uh, Glenn Adamson has in his book, Invention of Craft, where he talks about the importance of friction in craft, the way in which, uh, particularly through use of materials, uh, that there is a dialogue between the concept and its realization, uh, which, which cannot be anticipated immediately. And as a mm. designer working in graphics, to go via that route of these crafts 
seems to be something which isn't just a, like a, a laborious detour, but actually something quite creative. And it's a great example of that. I wanted to ask you about uh, the, the meaning of the original designs, because obviously in cases like tattoo, for instance, you imagine that some of the symbols have their own meanings. Uh, was there any uh, sort of crossover in terms of the, the way in which the fonts were created with those meanings? Uh, or are those the sorts of things that are distilled from the process? No, the, that's a, a very interesting question. Um, uh, I'm just trying to find an interest, uh, appropriate slide if I can. Um, so I'm just going, I mean, I don't know if you can see this, but basically, uh, I mean, there were not a lot of crossovers. The meanings um, in the tattoos were very different than what they are in the Latin script. Uh, because, you know, the, the craftspeople, the artisans themselves were not aware of whether something is an S or an N or an M. But um, I know this S is really small here, but one thing interesting that happened was the, the scorpion showed up in the S. So these are actually the tattoos the scorpion tattoo, uh, I, I wish I had a bigger image, but hopefully you can find it online later, uh, showed up in S, and which is one of those kind of weird uh, synchronicities that happen where they just, you know, they, they were randomly filling up these various uh, counters on their own. Um, and so there was not a lot of interaction in terms of meaning from the original context to the letter context, if that's what your question is. But sometimes these magical inter interactions or I would say uh, intersections happened, such as this one. Mm. I could imagine there's not... potential for, for that kind of interaction to increase. I, I wondered about yes. the, the use of these designs as well. It seems like they're more, in terms of uh, typeface, that they're used particularly for things like uh, covers of books or uh, mm perhaps uh, even logos, as, as obviously we've worked on together, but uh, it's hard to imagine them, for instance, being used as, as typefaces for reading. Uh, yes. Is that your understanding of it? Yes, that's right. So these are known as display typefaces, uh, which are basically meant for larger sizes because of their detail and complexity. They're not meant for text type or reading. Uh, so that, that's not the application. It will never be legible at such a small size. So it's not intended for that in any case. Mm. Which uh, leads me to the next question. I know that one of the challenges that brought you back to India from the States was mm. uh, the sense in which the, the Hindi typeface is not something which has been developed in the same way that, say, the Latin script had. And... Yes. Uh, but most of uh, typecraft seems to be using the Latin script. Although it was wonderful to see the interaction, that educational tool you were using with uh, Hindi letters. Uh, mm. But do you think that most of the applications would be in the Latin script, that that's the, uh, the most uh, valuable way of doing this? Uh, it's a very valid question, Kevin. Um, there are a couple of points. Uh, one is that, of course, we have worked in Gujarati. We are going to be releasing a Gujarati-based uh, typeface, uh, which may become Devanagari, which means it will work in Hindi as well. Uh, you see right here, this is Pakko uh, embroidery from Gujarat. Uh, the thing is that with uh, Indic scripts, the number, there are two factors which make it tough to work in typecraft. One is the number of glyphs are very high, right? So they're in the hundreds versus in a Latin script, if you just did A to Z and uh, some numbers and punctuation, you have about 40 and you're done. Uh, say you're only doing capital letters, uh, but with, with uh, index scripts, they go into the hundreds. And then you have something called diacritics, like matras, which go above and below the letter or cross the letter in different ways, as you can see, um, that makes it complex. The second factor is that the market for these scripts. Maybe Hindi is different, but for Gujarati or Tamil or other scripts is much smaller than for a Latin script based font. Um, so that means income generation becomes a, you know, a challenge. This is Typecraft is very dependent on uh, funding, you know, from our partners. Um, 
So that that makes it difficult. Uh, however, I am, and we are all, like all the partners of TypeCraft, we are very interested in working in different scripts, and we hope to do that more so in the future. Just following along that line, the final question I had was about the, the adventure of what you're doing. I like that, that map that you showed with the different states where you had worked. And it does obviously lend itself to a desire to almost in an encyclopedic way to cover all of India eventually uh, reflecting, I mean, that, that's I'm sure an impossible task given the complexity of uh, the material cultures in India, but it's one of those that uh, could, be, could be quite an interesting way of framing this narrative. And <clears throat> I'm wondering if that's something which is driving you and uh, whether this is something also that you are interested in taking beyond India. Yeah, that's a, again a great question, Kevin. So yes, I mean, um, we, yeah, I, I, I'm always on the lookout for what, what are some of the crafts we can work on in, in a different part of the country. I mean, I think it's important to um, cover various parts of the country for various reasons. One is to, you know, uh, let people know about those communities and people living in those areas, their crafts. And the other is also uh, engagement with people from diverse backgrounds, which is something that I'm very interested in in any case. So diverse backgrounds doesn't mean just India. Of course, this could be, you know, all of, anywhere in the world. I mean, for, for instance, I'm very interested in working with tattoos from, uh, from say, New Zealand, the Maori tattoos. If there would be any artist interested in that, I would be very interested in taking that further. Um, you know, always interested in collaboration with different communities, different cultures, uh, to create something uh, of value. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Ishan. Uh, we've seen in recent times, particularly during the pandemic, how rich the graphic culture in India is. We've had a couple of articles around the FUD painters, for instance, who are depicting people wearing masks in order to teach best practice in terms of social distancing, which is really taken off in India. And uh, so you see the importance of, of this medium in a way of uh, conveying messages, but even perhaps beyond communication, you know, sharing a culture, showing how a culture can adapt to become a language that talks about not just the traditional forms, but what we're experiencing today. And I think what you're doing with typeface shows how that can extend beyond the particular locale. Uh, it can, through your licensing and the processes that it can become something that other people can use as well. And I think uh, we may see that with the, uh, with the folk artists as well through media like this, Zoom, where they can work on commissions on different parts of the world and uh, it could be very exciting future. So thank you so much for, for sharing that with us, Ishan, and look forward to continuing working together. Yes, likewise. Thank you very much for having me here. Thank you everyone for listening in.